Welcome to session 12. The purpose of this session is to encourage you to think critically about the materials you use in class. Before following the video, please consider the following questions. How necessary is it to work from a course book in the classroom? What are the advantages and disadvantages of using a course book? If you could choose which course book to use, what would you look for? What factors would you consider? And have you ever produced your own learning materials to use in a lesson? Why? And how successful do you think they were? This session is going to look at how materials are produced and adapted for specific teaching contexts and how existing materials can be evaluated for their use and purpose. While this training has primarily focused on Imperial English materials, which have been developed and designed to be meaningful, it is important that you use your own experience and judgment when using any material. Like we discussed in the lesson planning session, just because you may be exclusively using materials that require little planning or extra work from you, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't look for opportunities to do so. Once you know your learners well and understand their motivation and needs, you can adapt materials and certainly your approach. You should be able to teach the same material in different ways, depending on who you're teaching. We'll start by looking at the principles for material development. Brian Tomlinson outlines six key principles for material development of any kind. The first principle he discussed is that learners must be exposed to language which is rich. In other words, the language that learners are exposed to should be much larger than just the target language. It needs to cover a variety of genres, text types and vocabulary, and be good quality. His findings were that course books generally were not rich, but rather impoverished. Language should also be recycled naturally. This is something you should consider and take responsibility for when following a course, as it is difficult for course books to constantly reuse language when there is limited time and most of that time is spent introducing new language. Most courses will spend a lesson teaching a new point, like the present perfect for example, and it won't be seen again explicitly in any other topic. So it is up to you to use a variety of language that is rich, and in doing so you will be recycling previous target language and embedding it. It is important that all this language is also relevant to the learners. This may seem obvious, but it's so often overlooked. Again, this is difficult to prepare materials for when you don't know the learner, so needs adaptation from the teacher. Because unless learners are exposed to language that is meaningful to them, they won't acquire it. You should therefore view your materials as a resource and not a script. In terms of comprehensibility, Tomlinson defines it as learners being able to understand well enough in order to access what is being talked about. It's difficult for course books to contextualize all language due to the same issue with opportunities to recycle language. There is limited time and space, but it's essential. Research shows that when a vocabulary item is taken in, it's taken in with contextual information which is stored as part of the meaning of the word. Think back to what we discussed in the vocabulary session. New words need those seven things in order to be learned and retained. And finally, linked to this, language needs to be embodied. This means that learners don't just hear or see words, they get extra linguistic information like intonation, repetition for emphasis, punctuation and contextual information. Tomlinson highlights that we visualize what we are listening to and also we use the inner voice to repeat what we hear and read. But there is evidence that language learners don't do this with new language, so encouraging that visualization and inner voice is essential. So, how can we ensure all of these aspects are considered when exposing learners to language? What activities could you do? Here are some that Tomlinson suggests. Include activities that are task-free. For example, tell learners a story or read an extract from a newspaper and just have a discussion rather than comprehension questions. Give them the script or text and let them build their own library in their own way. This way, you're rapidly increasing their exposure to the language in a stress-free way. Alternatively, you could ask learners to bring their own article. Then you're engaging their interests as well as encouraging them to search for English independently. Most training will tell you that 
teacher talk time should be limited. This is true in the teaching sense, like giving instructions and lesson introductions, but letting tasks go off on a tangent when students are engaged and chatting informally can be valuable to learners. As we've said several times, the teacher is the model and letting your students engage with you and hear you speak informally and naturally is the best model. We often overlook how much English is around us. Helping to raise learners' awareness of this will increase their engagement and exposure outside the classroom and will encourage them to look for it more too. Unstructured interaction doesn't necessarily even need planning. For example, if students are talking to each other in English before the class has started, let them carry on for a while and don't interrupt. Letting them talk about what they want without correction or feedback helps with confidence. We talk to ourselves a lot in our heads, usually in our first language, and we should try to do the same in our second language too. Set homework tasks or ongoing reminders that encourage learners to think in English while they're doing something normal or mundane, like sitting in front of the passenger seat of a car and looking out the window. All of these activities require very little planning and will ensure that learners are constantly exposed to English. Do you think you can incorporate any of these tasks into your teaching? Do you do any of these things already? Pause for a moment to think about this. The second key principle that Tomlinson highlights is that learners need to be emotionally engaged in their learning experience. This may seem obvious, but it's so often not a motivation when writing materials. If students are emotionally engaged at the time they're introduced to the language, they are more likely to acquire it. Texts and tasks in course books are frequently not emotionally engaging or are culturally irrelevant. The Imperial English courses have been designed with the learner in mind. All topics should be accessible and relevant to the learner, but in order to make them more relatable to different cultures, learners and environments, the teacher can adapt them and exploit them according to the learner's interests. This goes back to the importance of knowing your students, their motivation for learning and their interests. Think about a group of students you have taught recently. What do they engage with most? What tasks do they like doing? What are their motivations for learning? Pause for a moment to think about this and talk to a colleague if possible. The third principle introduced was that learners need to be cognitively engaged in their learning experience. This means making use of activities that encourage a personal response, stimulating learners to think before, after and during language use. Can you think of any example tasks that you could use? The next principle mentioned was that learners can benefit from using the mental resources that are typically applied when acquiring their first language. When learning our mother tongue, we're usually unaware of the learning process. We learn subconsciously. But think for a moment about how a baby or toddler learns language. What do they do? What do the parents do? We copy and repeat things. We recycle language. Parents encourage sensory imaging and visualization, as well as encouraging the inner voice to help. So why should this be any different from learning a second language? The teacher can encourage visualization, use imagery, and actually encourage students to reflect on their own mental activity during a task. An example of this reflection might be to get learners to draw what they can remember from a reading text or make notes of the visual images that pop into their head during a listening task. Can you think of any others? Pause for a moment to think about this and talk to a colleague if possible. Another principle Tomlinson raises is that learners can benefit from noticing the important features of the input and discovering how they're used themselves. In terms of material development, this requires some experimental activities and freedom for the learners to decipher the learning point themselves. Can you think of any example activities where learners can do this? The last principle that Tomlinson pointed out is that learners need opportunities to use language in order to achieve communicative purposes. Again, it seems obvious, but not a lot of time is given to it in course books. When teaching from a course with little teaching advice, it's easy to interpret tasks in different ways. 
So it's a good idea to bear in mind that activities are ultimately designed for use rather than practice. The reason for teaching a language point is not just so it can be practiced in class, it is supposed to be useful for students to use in real life. Let's look more at authentic materials. Authentic materials can be a rich language resource to use in the classroom. The material used in the class needs to be pitched at the right level and there needs to be planning and preparation. Do you use authentic materials? Pause for a moment to think about this. Using newspaper articles is a popular resource for introducing learners to authentic materials. Look at the article on the slide and think about how you could use it in class. Think about skills activities or a grammar and vocabulary focus. Also, think about how you could adapt the activities based on a range of levels. Pause for a moment to think about this and talk to a colleague if possible. Think about using newspapers as a resource in general. How can they be used in a classroom? Consider all aspects and features of a paper, not just the article itself, both online and print versions. Pause for a moment and make notes on the features. Here are some suggested ways you can use a newspaper in class. Did you think of any that aren't listed? The front page and headlines throughout can be used as an elicitation tool for speaking. All the images can be used as a grammar elicitation tool for example, asking questions like, what is happening in the image? Horoscopes are a typical feature of British and American newspapers. They can be used for practicing future tenses, prediction, and generally a wider debate. Advertisements of all kinds can be used for vocabulary, persuasive language, and go on to prompt student group projects, like making their own companies and adverts. Announcements, again, are a feature of typical British and American newspapers particularly local ones, for announcing weddings, funerals, graduations, and so on. Weather forecasts can be used for interpretation, prediction, conditionals, and future tenses. There are also some that have not been mentioned, like TV guides and celebrity news. How could these be used? Pause for a moment to think about this, and talk to a colleague if possible. Look at the information on the slide. Imagine you are going to teach this group of students. Thinking about that group of students, how can you adapt and exploit this material to engage them? Pause the session for 20 minutes to think about your ideas and discuss them with a colleague if possible. These are the hashtag words to take from this session. Write a short summary of the session using the hashtag words and examples where possible.